This lesson is about centripetal acceleration. Okay. In the last lesson, we talked about rotational motion. And in rotational motion, quite often, the rotation is something that is moving in a circle. Okay. So uh, in this section, in this lesson, we're going to talk about uh, what does it take to cause something to move in a circle. For example, let's imagine that we tie a tennis ball to a string. Okay, and we're going to swing this tennis ball around in a circle over our head. Okay, so we're sort of looking down uh, at the top view of this tennis ball. And it's moving around in a circle at constant speed. Okay, now, even though it's moving at a constant speed, this tennis ball is still accelerating because acceleration, the definition of acceleration, if you remember back in chapter two, the definition of acceleration is change in velocity over time. And velocity is a vector. So if either the magnitude or the direction of the velocity is changing, there is an acceleration. If something is moving in a circle at a constant speed, the magnitude of the velocity is not changing, but the direction of the velocity is changing. Therefore, there is, uh, therefore there is an acceleration. If we wanted to figure out what kind of acceleration, then uh, we need to expand this term right here, the delta V term. That would be uh, velocity 2 minus velocity 1. So uh, we would need to know what is the velocity at, at two different points of this ball uh, going around in a circle. The point where I've drawn the ball right now, the velocity is in this direction. Whenever you have something moving in a circle, its velocity turns out to be always tangent to the circle. Okay, so that is vector V1. The instantaneous velocity of the tennis ball right there at that spot is V1. Okay, well, a moment later, the ball's going to be right here. Uh, at that point, the velocity is also uh, tangent to the circle. Okay. And that is V2. If you take uh, vector V2 minus vector V1, and you'd have to uh, do that by components, so if you subtract those vectors by components, then what you find is that the acceleration, V2 minus V1, is actually pointing this way, toward the center of the circle. And that would be true of any place that you pick on that circle, if you were to ask what's the acceleration at that point, the acceleration would always point toward the center of the circle. All right, so that's a general rule. Okay, anytime an object uh, moving uh, in a circle at constant speed has an acceleration toward the center of the circle. Toward the center. Now, 
because it's toward the center, we give it a name centripetal. Okay, it's called centripetal acceleration. Centripetal means towards the center. Literally, I think it means center seeking, but a little more loosely translated, it means toward the center. Uh, and that is true of any object moving in a circle at constant speed. Now, force is equal to mass times acceleration. So if there's an acceleration of an object toward the center of the circle, there must also be a force toward the center of the circle. Okay, so that implies that there is also a force uh, toward the center. And that is called centripetal force. It's important to understand, though, that centripetal force is not a new type of force. Uh, it's just a description that tells us what direction the force is pointing in. Uh, for example, when in the, the tennis ball drawing that I have up there at the top, uh, the force that is pulling the tennis ball toward the center of the circle is the tension in the string that I have tied to the tennis ball. Okay, so it's not some mysterious centripetal force that uh, guides the tennis ball toward the center. It's a real force caused by a real string. Uh, and centripetal just tells us the direction of that force, not what caused it. Uh, another example might be if your car is going around a circular curve at constant speed, then there must be a force on your car toward the center of the curve. Uh, we would call that force a centripetal force, but that's not that doesn't tell us the physical origin of the force. Uh, in that example, the physical origin of the force would be friction between your car's tires and the road. If friction wasn't there, your car would not go in a circle. It would slide off the curve. Okay, so uh, don't get confused into thinking that centripetal force is some new kind of force. It simply tells you the direction that the force is pointing. All right, well, we can uh, be quantitative with this. I, I told you the direction of the acceleration, but I did not uh, say anything about the magnitude of the acceleration. So I'm going to clear the screen now, and we'll talk about what uh, We'll talk about what is the magnitude of that acceleration. There we go. Got most of it. Okay, so uh, the magnitude of the centripetal acceleration is given by this equation. A equals V squared over R. V uh, is the constant speed. Uh, and R is the radius of the circle. Okay, that's the radius of the circle. And since F equals MA, the centripetal force must be equal to M V squared over R. Uh, let's work an example where I show you how to apply those equations. Uh, let's just stick with that tennis ball being swung around on a string. Okay, so let's uh, find Uh, the force and uh, the force on and the acceleration of a tennis ball uh, being swung in a circle of uh, radius say of 
70 centimeters. Uh, and let's say it goes around the circle. So it, it makes uh, one revolution around the circle each second. Okay, uh, we need the mass of the tennis ball too. So let's say the mass of the tennis ball is 20 grams. Right. Okay, first let's find the acceleration. The acceleration is the speed squared over the radius. The radius is given as 70 centimeters, but what's the speed? We don't have the speed. We actually are given uh, how long it takes the tennis ball to go around once, which is one second. Well, uh, I can find the speed from that because if an object is traveling in a circle, then the distance that it travels in one turn is just the circumference of the circle, or 2 pi r. Right? So the distance traveled by this tennis ball in one turn is 2 pi r. Distance equals rate times time. So if I take the distance and I divide it by the time for one turn, then I get the speed. And so it goes 2 pi r distance in one turn, and it takes one second for one turn. So the speed is 2 pi times 70 centimeters, let's change that to meters, 0 0.70 meters. And the time it takes to go around one time is one second. So I can take this number and plug it in for V so that the acceleration is equal to 2 pi times 70 centimeters or 0.7 meters squared over uh, one second squared, so actually that should be here, one second, uh, over r, 0 0.70 meters, that's this and that. Okay, well, at this point, uh, you can just uh, plug in the numbers. We'll need a calculator for that part, or at least I will. Okay, 2 times pi times 0.7. squared is 19.3, and then we'll divide by 0.7, and you get 27.6. That's meters per second squared. Now, that's a big acceleration. That's almost 3 Gs, right? If you took that and divided it by 9.8, you'd get the number of Gs. So, let's see, 27.6 divided by 9.8 is 2.8 Gs. So, that is a big acceleration, uh, but that's okay because we're swinging the ball around fairly fast in a circle of a tight radius. And to get something to move in a in a tight radius circle, uh, you actually do have to accelerate it quite a bit. Uh, so uh, that answer is correct, 27.6 meters per second squared. Then to find the force, uh, all we have to do is multiply by the mass. Uh, so S is equal to 20 grams is 0 0.02 kilograms. And then we'll just multiply that by the acceleration of 27.6 meters per second squared. Okay, so that would be 2.8. 
times 0 0.02, and you get about 0 0.55 newtons. Yes, equals 0 0.55 newtons. That is the force on the tennis ball. So it's a pretty small force, uh, even though it's a big acceleration because tennis balls don't have a very big mass. Okay. Um, now I'm going to ask you a couple of those uh, check your understanding questions. So I'm going to clear the screen, so pause if you, uh, you're not done writing down what I wrote. All right, uh, sticking with the tennis ball, I'm swinging this tennis ball over my head. Okay, in a horizontal circle. So this is the top view. Uh, and uh, here is the uh, tennis ball going around in a circle. It's going around uh, clockwise from this view. And there's the tennis ball. And let's say that at that point that where I have drawn the tennis ball, the string breaks. So uh, what will happen to the tennis ball? I want you to pick which path do you think would be most correct for the path followed by the tennis ball when the string breaks? Uh, this is path A. This is path B. This is path C. And this is path D. D is supposed to be a straight line, but I can't draw a straight line on my computer screen very well. OK. okay. So uh, pause the video. Think about what you think the correct answer is and why. Like, try to come up with a law of physics that explains your answer. Don't just guess, but explain it with a law of physics. Then unpause, and I'll tell you the answer. Okay, the correct answer is C, uh, because Newton's first law says that an object in motion will stay in motion in the same direction with the same speed unless a net force acts on it. Well, the instant that the string breaks, there's no horizontal force acting on the tennis ball anymore. So the instant that the string breaks, it will go in a straight line in the same direction that it was moving at that instant. Well, the velocity of an object moving in a circle is tangent to the circle. So at that instant, the velocity is in the direction of C. So according to Newton's first law, it will continue moving in the direction of C until some other horizontal force acts on it. Maybe it hits the wall. Uh, and then it would change its velocity, but not until. Okay, that is the end of this lesson.